Hello and welcome back to Manifolds, the video series where we want to do vector calculus on generalized surfaces. And you might have already noticed that we get closer and closer to the whole machine of differentiation and integration. Indeed, today's part 26 is a short transition video where we talk about the so-called Ricci calculus. And after that, we will introduce a lot of new objects that we need to do integration on manifolds. However, before we start with the definitions, I really want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, here on YouTube, on Patreon or by other means. And by using the link in the description, you can download PDF versions, quizzes and exercises for the videos. Okay, then without further ado, let's start talking about the Ricci calculus, which is often called tensor calculus. Now it's important to know that for understanding many faults or the analysis with them, this Ricci calculus is not really needed. However, it's an important calculation tool, which is often used for having short notations, especially in physics. And therefore, I want to explain it a little bit, such that you know what it means when you see it. Now, one important thing you can immediately remember is that with the Ricci calculus, we calculate with coordinates. What this means, you already know, if we have a manifold M, we just use a local chart to translate the points from M into Rn. More concretely, we would come from the other direction, so we use a parameterization. So in short, you can remember the Ricci calculus or tensor calculus always deals with this lower level here. In particular, you can use n indices to denote the n coordinates you have here. However, now the Ricci calculus does something funny, namely the positions of the different indices matter. Indeed, you have to deal with superscripts and subscripts. This means here we have a hidden meaning in the position of a given index. However, I would say let's do that in more detail now. And we can do that by using a table. On the left hand side, let's write down the objects in our language as we had it before. And on the right hand side, let's use the new Ricci calculus. First, let's consider the components of a given chart we usually denote with uh. So you know, u is the subset in M and h is the homeomorphism to Rn. So in particular, we always would write h as a map from u into Rn. However, now the Ricci calculus on the right would only consider the component functions of h, which means we have maps from u into R. And there, indeed, we would already use a superscript. And there you see, for j going from 1 to n, we have our n coordinates. However, usually h is already too fancy here and one just writes x1, x2 and so on for the coordinates. In the Ricci calculus this makes sense, because we don't need a special name for the map here, the map can have the same name as the coordinates in Rn. So you just have to know that these denote maps or numbers depending on the context. However, this nicely fits when we go to the coordinate basis of the tangent space Tpm. There you know, we have already introduced a very short notation for this standard basis of the tangent space. Namely, we use the parameterization phi to push the canonical basis in Rn forwards. And please recall, for submanifolds, we immediately saw the relation with the partial derivatives of phi. Therefore, in the Ricci calculus, we also use the STEL operator, but now with respect to these coordinates. In particular, in the denominator, we have superscripts again. Okay, now by having a basis of TPM, we can just write down a general tangent vector. Indeed, we already know how this works in an abstract way. On the left hand side, we just have an equivalence class of a curve gamma. However, since we have a basis of the vector space, we can simply span this tangent vector by using the basis vectors. So you could say this is simply given by v1 del1 plus v2 del2 and so on. And in fact, this is exactly the standard in the Ricci calculus. However, you might already know, for the components v, we now use superscripts. 
And then we would also sum the whole thing until we reach Vn. However, since such constructions occur a lot if you work with coordinates, one wants to shorten that even more. And one does that by introducing a new convention. Namely, it tells you if you see two indices of the same name, one upstairs and one downstairs, you have to sum over it. In other words, here implicitly there is a sum sign over j here. But because we agree to this convention, we will never write the sum sign in the Ricci calculus. It's always completely omitted. Moreover, I can tell you this thing has a name, usually we call it the Einstein summation convention. So not a complicated thing, but you see, it makes the whole notation shorter. Okay, so since we have superscripts and subscripts involved in the Ricci calculus, we also introduce two new names for vectors. Namely, a vector like this one that has superscripts for the components is called a contravariant vector. And the opposite will be a so-called covariant vector. Now, the two names come from the fact that the two vectors transform differently under some transformations, but we can just remember we have superscripts and subscripts now. And moreover, we will also go into more details for the names later. For the moment, you can just remember that a tangent vector is called a contravariant vector in the Ricci calculus. In some sense, this is important to know, because in the Ricci calculus, you would just calculate with the components and coordinates anyway and forget about the whole framework behind it. So you could say, this is the power of the Ricci calculus in explicit calculations, but of course, you lose some connections to the mathematical ideas. Maybe, in order to understand what this means, let's look at an example here. Namely, we could take, like in linear algebra, an inner product on our vector space TPM. So you would say you have a bilinear map with two inputs for the vectors. And usually we denote such an inner product with the pointy brackets, and now we take tangent vectors V and W. And there you should know, we get a real number out. Now, such an inner product means we can measure angles and lengths on our vector space TPM. In other words, this means our tangent space gets some geometry. However, on the right hand side, this is now just a calculation with the components Vj and Wj. And moreover, the whole information of the inner product is fixed in a matrix G. And there we have to put the indices downstairs because then the summation convention tells us that we have a double sum here for the index j and k. In other words, as we should, we get a real number out. Okay, but we also get a new name here, such a matrix here in the Ricci calculus is usually called a tensor. But there I can already tell you, we will define these things later in the correct way. At the moment, this table should just help you to recognize when some people use the Ricci calculus. There are definitely benefits for that, but you should never forget about the background. Okay, then I would say, for the end of this video, let's write down the dual vector for such a contravariant vector on the right here. And please don't forget, a contravariant vector is just a tangent vector. However, dual to that, would be a vector where the components have subscripts. Moreover, that also means that the corresponding basis vectors need superscripts. Because then we apply the Einstein summation convention again to omit the sum symbol. Okay, but if we are interested in the theory, we are not so interested in the components, but rather in this object as a vector. Indeed, this object dxj is what we will need for integrations later. In fact, the name of this object is not so complicated, it's simply called a one form. And seeing the d in the notation here, you might already expect that this thing is related to the differential of a smooth map. Therefore, you can already remember a one form has to do something with linear maps. In fact, this linear map here is not complicated at all, and if we see it here on the left hand side, we could just write 
dxj and then we can put a tangent vector in it as we know it from the differential of a smooth map. So let's say we take the kth basis vector from our coordinate basis. And then what should come out here is simply 1 or 0. And of course 1 we only have if the indices coincide. In other words, what you see here is that the result is simply the Kronecker delta jk. Okay, so this is an important result you can already remember, but if we want to write it down in the Ricci calculus, we have to be careful with the superscripts and subscripts. More precisely, this newly defined one form has a superscript. And then we put in a tangent vector, and then you see this index is downstairs. Therefore, usually in the Ricci calculus, the Kronecker delta is used in a different notation. Namely, the indices can also be put in as subscripts and superscripts. Just remember there, the meaning is still the same Kronecker delta here. Okay, now I think that's enough for calculating with indices for the moment. In the next video, I want to define such one forms here. And as you already see it here, we will define it as linear maps going from the tangent space to R. Okay, then let's meet in the next video and have a nice day. Bye bye.